Fantastic. Well, as we've already heard and celebrated, last weekend was a huge weekend across the world. Christians gathered from all different places to actually celebrate and remember the what is the central focus of our faith. And it's not Christmas. It's actually Easter. And without the truth that we're celebrating at Easter, we wouldn't actually have a, a Christian faith at all. And so it's wonderful what happened last weekend. We celebrate it, but I'm here to tell you some very good news. I'm going to say it from here, that it's Easter all the time. It's Easter all the time. Easter is not an event we celebrate once a year. It's actually an ongoing spiritual reality that we're meant to be living in every day. It's what it's intended to be. In fact, every time you take communion, do you know what you're celebrating? You're celebrating the very same truth of Easter. That's why Jesus said, listen, I don't want you to forget the spiritual, the spiritual reality that I purchased for you through my cross and resurrection. And I know you guys are going to get worried about your mortgage. You're going to get worried about other things. You'll get distracted. So I'm going to make sure you never forget. I'm going to bring you back again and again and again to the primary spiritual reality that I made real for you when I died and rose again from the dead. And when you partake of that wafer and drink that juice, you are enacting again this spiritual truth, Christ's life in me, Christ's spirit in me. That's what we're celebrating every time. Jesus said, do this. When we're taking communion, he said, now do this in remembrance of me. But what is it that Jesus wants us to remember? What is it? Well, sadly, many people are looking at the process of his death rather than the purpose of it. Well, they're going to thinking about the Roman whipping. They're thinking about the, the, the thorns, the, the crown of thorns that put upon his head and how somebody goes through the, the process of dying by crucifixion. And I'm not here to belittle any of those things, but I'm saying if that's what you're trying to remember, you're trying to mourn over the terrible tragedy uh, of Jesus' death, then you're looking in the wrong place. Jesus doesn't want to look you to look at the purpose, or sorry, the, the process. He actually wants to, you to look at the purpose, the purpose of his death. So we're not remembering this sad occasion where we're just going over those things. We're remembering the purpose. Jesus isn't saying, now listen, I don't want you to ever forget I suffered and died for you. So you better be obedient and you better worship me because I did it for you. I don't think that's what we're meant to be remembering. I think what Jesus is saying to us, I don't want you to ever forget that my blood was shed for your forgiveness of sin so that you can hold your head up, that you can enter the throne of grace and find grace in your time of need. Don't you ever forget that. Don't you forget, as I see you struggling with the issues of life, that my spirit is in you to overcome. In the world you will have tribulation, but fear not. I have overcome the world and my overcoming life is in you. Don't you ever forget that. That's what he wants us to remember. I see you, see, see you in sickness and disease. Don't you ever forget that by my stripes you're healed. Don't forget that. I'm the Lord that heals you. Don't forget when you feel oppressed by the powers of darkness that my blood was shed to break off your life the oppression of the enemy. Don't you ever forget that you are precious to me. I have redeemed you. You are mine and I embrace you today. That's what Jesus wants us to keep remembering because they are the spiritual realities of Easter. So the cross is not a tragedy that we're, more, oh, that's so bad. 
It's a triumph, not a tragedy. And that triumph is captured for us in the final words that Jesus uttered on the cross. Here it is in John 19, 30. And when he received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. What does that mean? What did Jesus mean? It's the equivalent of saying mission accomplished. It is completely completed. That's actually what he was saying. So in that moment, Jesus was announcing the end of his earthly mission, mission accomplished. So he was born, he comes into the world, he breaks oppression, he heals the sick, he forgives, he lifts the oppressed, he breaks bondages and he stands at that cross and then he says, it is finished. But now guess what? We get to start, not back here, but here. We get to start here. We don't get to start in the types and shadows of the old covenant. We get to start where Jesus finished. And do you, that's what we want to unpack because this is why Easter is always. This is why Easter is always. We get to start where Jesus finished. We're not starting back in the old covenant with all those types and shadows. We're starting at the finish, which means we already have so much that we're striving to get. God's saying, no, you have received it because it is finished, it's accomplished, it's completed. And to emphasize what Jesus had accomplished on the cross, two things immediately happened, or one immediately, and that was Matthew 27, we're told there was a heavy, thick veil in the temple in Jerusalem, which signified the barrier between the, the presence of humanity in the presence of God and at that moment where he declared it is finished as a sign that of what became a spiritual reality in that moment God tore the veil from the top it had to be God from the top to the bottom signifying come on in the barrier has been removed I receive you into my presence the other thing that is very significant is later on we're told that Jesus ascended back into heaven and sat down at the right hand of the Father. And some of us might think, well, okay, we get that. He must have been tired. It was pretty taxing stuff. You know, have a rest. But what we're supposed to get from the fact that the Bible wants us to know that we have a seated Savior is that's what you do when you're finished. That's what you do when there's nothing left to do. You sit down. And that's what the Bible is trying to say to us. We have a seated Savior and He's not going to do any more for you than what He's already done because it is finished. He's finished. And if He was to get up, that would imply that He wasn't finished, that He forgot a few things. Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot about that. Let me come down and fix that up because I overlooked that part. No, we don't want Jesus to get up. We want him to stay seated. And now the rest of our Christian lives, what we're really doing is accessing what is finished, what he has completely completed on our behalf. And so there's nothing left to do but access what's been done. And uh, so how does this spiritual reality play out? Come on, we're going to drill down. Is that all right? Let's get intensely practical. It's great to say, it's finished. But what in practical terms does that look at like when we live it out in our Christian life? Let me give you an example of, of the dilemma that often I think we find ourselves in. Say, for instance, da -na -na -na. Dun, 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 dun. Say, for instance, 
I've been cooking in the kitchen, which is really fictitious because I'm never going there. <laughs> Why not? Even, even when I preach, we can get into parables and fantasies. All right, so I'm cooking in the kitchen and I've been working on this spaghetti sauce. This is the sauce of all sauces. That's pretty good for somebody with a list to say, sauce of all sauces. All right, and so I emerge. And I say, it is finished. And you go, that's great. Appreciate that. Yeah, but I wanted tomatoes. And I say, I put it in there. Yeah, yeah, but I wanted garlic. Well, I put it in there. Well, I wanted herbs and spices. Well, I put it in there. Well, I wanted onions. I put it in there. It's already in the sauce. You don't need to go and add it. It's already in there. And this is like us going, well, Jesus, we're so glad it is finished, but you go ahead and take a rest because as soon as you rested, could you come back down here and heal me? Could you come back down here and and help me and deliver me and, and give me freedom? Can you come back down and touch my life again because I'm so glad you're seated. You have a rest. It's finished. It's great. But there's still stuff to do. Because I want this and I want that. Uh, I need my freedom. And Jesus says, it's in the source. I already put it in there. (laughs) All right? It doesn't need to be added. Stop striving for what you already have. Stop striving for what you already have. Listen, this is so important. So important. If you get this, it will radically change the position from which you're living your Christianity. If you're living it from back here, it's hard work. But if you realize, oh, no, no, no. I'm starting from here. I'm starting from here. I'm accessing. I'm not using my faith to overwhelm God's reluctance. I'm actually using my faith to access God's willingness. I'm using my faith to access what is already mine. My faith isn't intended to be trying to wrestle with this reluctant God. It's actually accessing what is already mine in Jesus' name. So it's so important because... When you don't start at the finish, we make the mistake of thinking that it's required of us to earn. (laughs) We're still in this earning mode. I have to do things to achieve God's favor and forgiveness. And so we perform religious activities to make ourselves more acceptable to God. But God views our efforts to add to what he calls finished. You know what he calls those things? Self-righteousness. Because really, when we're trying to add to what God says is finished, he says that's unbelief in what I've done for you. You are exercising, you are demonstrating unbelief. And that's why anything that you do that's trying to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ, God can't bless it. Because if he put his hand on it to bless, he would endorse it. He would say, that's right, you actually do need to do more because it's not quite finished. That's why any work that we do in self-righteousness, God views as pride and God gives grace to the humble. And the humble are those who realise, I have received everything by inheritance. Surely I am not worthy. That's right. But through Christ, I receive so much loving kindness, so much mercy. And mercy is only mercy when you don't deserve it. The moment you think you deserve it, it's no longer mercy. So this is where we need to understand that Easter is for always and we need to live in it all the time. All right? the grace of God to the humble because those that are starting here at the finish know that no amount of prayer, Bible study or obedience can make you any more acceptable to God than you are right now by the blood of Jesus. Again, no amount 
a prayer, Bible study, or obedience can make you any more loved and accepted by God than you are right now by the blood of Jesus. Come on, this is living in Easter all the time. They were living in Easter all the time. It's not, oh, wow, it's got to come around again in another 12 months. No, this is an ongoing spiritual. The cross changed our spiritual reality. It changed it forever. All right. So Jesus said it is finished. He sat down, which means he is not going to do any more for you than what he's already done. He meant it. I'm finished. And now the rest of your Christian life, you're accessing, you're unpacking in an unfolding revelation of what was done for you 2,000 years ago. You might think that God's doing it for you in that moment, but really all you're doing is seeing what has been done. And because the veil is lifted and you see it, you now enter into the experience of it. But Jesus is seated the whole time watching you have an unfolding revelation of what he meant when he said it is finished all that time ago. So we may mistakenly think that God might be still doing stuff for us, but really all that's happening is we are accessing your freedom. Listen, your freedom is not a reward for what you do. It's not a reward for what you do. It's an awakening to who you already are. And you think, wow, it just happened in that moment. No, you just awakened to who you already are. That's all that really happened. How do we know this? Well, listen to the way Paul the Apostle prays for us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. Notice he's not praying that God does any more for us. He's praying that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened so we can see the hope of our calling, the riches of our inheritance, the exceedingly great power that's available. He's praying for us to see it. Not for God to do it, but for us to actually see who we already are. I love this verse, 2 Corinthians 3.15. It says, that it talks about our faces being unveiled. And as they are unveiled, <laughs> we're transformed. Why? Because the light of the cross, the light of it is finished, and all that the light finally reaches us, the veil comes off, the realization hits us, and that's where the transformation happens. Not in Jesus getting up and doing more, but in us seeing more. Amen. The Bible is praying that you will see more not that God will do more. So it's Easter all the time. Ephesians 1, 3 says, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms has already, Amen. has already. Amen. Does the word already mean the same in Malaysia as it does in Australia? I mean, already been lavished. I like that word, lavished, come on, upon us as a love gift from our wonderful heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That, my friends, is in the Bible. <laughs> All right, so Second Peter says, everything that you could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by His divine power. Come on, so important. I'm a man with a mission up here today. Come on. People seeing that saying, wow, I keep striving, begging, reaching when it's finished. I'm back here when I, I should be starting here. Changes my language. It changes my prayer life. It changes the way of my expectancy and the way that I'm using my faith not to twist the arm of a reluctant God but to actually access who I already am by inheritance. And so that's why we're told to pray with thanksgiving, everybody. We're told to pray with thanksgiving. And so why is it important for us to understand that it's Easter all the time? Well, because when we don't realize it, we end up with believers praying like beggars 
thinking they need to use their faith to overcome God's reluctance instead of accessing what they already have. What did Peter say to the crippled man at the gate? Beautiful. Oh, let me just pray for you. He said, such as I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, no prayer. No prayer. He just says, I have something and I'm going to minister it to you. When we don't understand that it's Easter all the time and we don't start at the finish, we have believers still fighting a defeated devil. <laughs> When in reality, there is no competition of strength between God and the devil. Come on. How could a fallen angelic being be a match for the God who created that being in the first place? How could that be? No, we're standing here and we're enforcing the victory that we already have. That's what's really going on. And so after... He had finished, Jesus said, all power in heaven and on earth had been given to me. So listen, if I've got all of something, how much do you have? You got nothing. So Jesus is saying, I got it all. He's got nothing. <laughs> all right. So now in this place of all authority, we're standing and now we're enforcing that victory in the name of Jesus. So why is it important that we understand it's Easter all the time? Well, Easter changed our spiritual reality and this is intended to put an end to covenantal confusion. What do I mean by covenantal confusion? I mean people using scriptures from the old covenant to form their beliefs about how God expects them to act under the new covenant. Stop doing that. That's covenantal confusion. <laughs> Again, covenantal confusion is we're going back into the old covenant thinking that this is God telling us how we're meant to live under the new covenant. No, the cross changed our spiritual reality. Look at this verse in uh, Hebrews 8, it says, But Christ, who was being rewarded with far more important work than those who serve under the old law, because the new agreement that he passes on to us from God contains far more wonderful promises. The old agreement didn't even work. If it had, there would have been no need for another to replace it. Hebrews 10 you know how it describes all the good God things of the old covenant? Shadows. They're shadows. They're good. They're wonderful shadows. But as they passed through the cross, they became their new covenant reality. Let's have a look at this diagram up on the screen. Uh, have I have we got a stand over here? There's so many things we could draw up there, but this is me trying to communicate how that good God thing of the old covenant passed through the cross and became a new covenant reality. Through the law, Moses was given, but guess what? It passed through the cross. And through Jesus, we received grace. Under the old covenant, under the old covenant, you know what? There was no chairs in the temple. You know why? Because the priest could never sit down because their work was never finished. Wow. What did Jesus do? He sat down. He gave, passed through the cross, became the sacrifice once and for all and forever. Back then, you had to go to the select to elect holy man of God with all the bells and smells. And... He was the mediator between you and God. You, you couldn't approach God directly. You had to go through. Guess what? That was a shadow of the spiritual reality of the priesthood of all believers. No longer do we need to geographically travel to Jerusalem. You can if you want to. But actually, spiritually speaking, you are the temple, the mobile portal, the walking temple of the Holy Spirit. And so we could go on with all these spiritual realities that have now become ours through passing through the cross. 
wonderful. And so I love, listen, don't get me wrong. I love all the poetic, symbolic language of the Old Testament. And I'm not saying we should abandon it. But when we use it, remember you're talking about a shadow. And anything the old covenant can do, the new covenant can do it better. You think that's good? Wow. What's the new covenant? If that's what the shadow looked like, what does the reality actually look like? All right. Anything the Old Testament can do, the New Testament can do better. So as all these truths passed through the cross, they became something wonderful and new. Like in the, in the book of Psalms, we read how they're crying out for more of God. Wonderful. But guess what? That passed through the cross and became the prayer. The prayer for more now is not more of God, but more revelation. My prayer for more is actually more revelation of who I already am. It's not lit, because to p- keep praying for God to do more is actually to imply that He shouldn't be sitting down. Hello. <laughs> Getting quiet in here. That's all right. So, you're the longing to be in God's presence that's spoken of in the old covenant passes through the cross and becomes the mystical union spoken of in John 15 of the branch and the vine permanently connected. The life of the vine flowing into the branch all the time. We're now the temple. The spiritual thirst spoken of in the old covenant has passed through the cross. And you know what? That's now become an invitation to drink of the perpetual stream of the rivers of living water that are within you. It passed through the cross and it became 24-7 access, Spirit of God inside of you. So today, tonight, I'm here to tell you that it's Easter all the time. And you get to start at the finish and that realisation means you are way ahead of where you think you are. You're way ahead of where you think you are. It's Easter all the time. And that gives us a totally different perspective from the position that we're living from. Looking back here, it gives me... But if I stand here, wow, things start to look different, very different. And that's what we need to understand. That from that position, we're not pushing forward to victory. We're standing in the position of victory. And we're overcomers in Jesus' name. And and so when we say, I need to get closer to God, from this perspective, well, that's, that's probably right. But please don't hear that term as a question of distance between you and God. That's not how, if you need to get closer to God, that's not, that's passed through the cross. It's no longer distance we're talking about because our God has promised never to leave us or forsake us. How can you possibly have a distance between the God who says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. It passed through the cross. And because it's Easter all the time, that saying, I need to get closer to God, is really about you overcoming your distraction and unawareness of who you already are. That feeling of you needing to get closer to God is really because you haven't realized who you are yet. And once that does, you realize, wow, He's so close. You know, God, does God hide from us? Yes, he does. And you know where his favorite hiding place is? Right there. Right there. I want to be a God chaser. Can you sort of move away a little bit so I can at least get a jogger? Jesus says, no, I'm staying right here. Because I promise never to leave you or forsake you. See, it's Easter all the time. And then we have this saying, Uh, And it's passed through the cross. Oh God, I'm so thirsty for you. We're wonderful. That's wonderful. But let's not glorify our thirst as if it's a mark of our spirituality. Because Jesus said, I'm going to put a river in you and you'll never thirst again. So if you're thirsty, for goodness sake, go ahead and drink. If you're thirsty, it means you stop drinking. 
So it's not a mark of spirituality. That's passed through the cross. I need to go to another level in God. Well, okay, but you're already raised with Christ and seated with Him in the heavenly realms, according to Ephesians 2. So I guess what you mean is, I need a greater revelation of who I already am and the position I'm already standing in. So, okay, Jesus said it is finished but that doesn't mean we're finished. We're still praying. We're still believing. We're still serving God. But we're doing it all from this position. That's where, and it, and it changes our prayer. It changes our believing. It changes our serving. Now we're declaring God's kingdom. But here's the thing. When, so sure, I'm not up here saying there's nothing left for us to do. I'm saying our doing takes place from here. It's a totally different perspective because when we start doing the works of service to God without first understanding what's been done, it is a cruel religious bondage. It is unplugged from the grace of God and it's dry religious works. So we need to realize, yes, I'm praying. Yes, I'm believing. Yes, I'm serving. But I'm actually doing it on the basis of what's already been done for me. That's where it's coming from. So, of course, there's so much to do. But we do it on the basis of what's being done. Now, I'm going to ask the singers and musicians to come back and help me. You could be thinking, well... You're up there, Pastor David, telling me that I'm loved, I'm accepted, I'm close to God, I'm filled with His fullness, but I don't feel like it's true. Well, what else is true about your life right now, but you don't feel like it's true? For some of you, the only reason why you realize it's Sunday is because you're sitting here. If you weren't sitting here, you wouldn't even know, oh, it's Sunday today. <laughs> so what else is true about your life right now that you don't feel like it's true? But it is. How many of you in this room are married? What are you going to do on the days like you don't feel like you're married? You're going to turn to your wife and say, honey, I don't feel married today. She's going to slap you. <laughs> you're in trouble. <laughs> All right. You know, da na na na. Hey, have I said da na 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 yet? It's like I need to put one in. What did you do to change your status from a single person to a married person? And in that moment of changing status, you had rights and privileges and responsibilities you didn't have before. What did you do? You stood in front of someone and you exchanged words. That celebrant witnessed your exchange of words and at the end of witnessing it, of what you said, he said, I now pronounce you husband and wife. Your status has now changed. On the basis of what you've said to one another, your status is different. You have different rights and responsibilities as of now. Would you turn to the celebrant and say, not feeling it, I just, don't feel it. Can you like do it again and stuff? Because I don't feel married. He's going to say, no, that's it. Now you have to believe who you really are now. You've changed your status. And that is the way God sees it that regardless of our doubts, the truth still remains. Look at this wonderful truth. To as many as did receive him and welcome him, he gave power, authority, rights, privileges to become the children of God. And I want to say, let God's greater truth overcome your lesser truth. God's promise to forgive and cleanse and accept us as His children is not a fragile uncertainty based on your performance. It's based on an agreement between God the Father and God the Son. And all you get to do is inherit what they did. 
That's really all you're doing. It's time you entered into that. The assurance of our forgiveness is based on two unchangeable things. God the Father, God the Son. <laughs> and we get to receive that. And our response is worship. Our response is gratitude. Our response is an overwhelming thankfulness towards God.